uh, and um, the real, the real many that are working on this. Uh, uh, um, there is a kind of a connection with the topics that you are working with uh, on uh, with our lab. So for me, that's very valuable. Uh, in fact, uh, um, I know you. I think you asked Martha to join it. Uh, so I just Hi. but yeah. uh, we asked you to join a project on the time, but. Uh, and uh, maybe this seminar would be the time finally of something that we put together. Uh, I've been a reviewer in your paper uh, in the past. So, uh, that, that's to say that there is, uh, there is a clear connection. I think uh, uh, it's very glad you here. Uh, yeah, well, he was part of a conference and was uh, uh, good enough to be to be able to do as with uh, this talk. Uh, I asked explicitly to talk about register of the report because I think it's something we don't discuss uh, a lot. Uh, but it's a particular type of uh, open science uh, project that uh, I would like to consider more in the future, which I consider very uh, um, structured. And even more than the, the, the very simple registration, so I think it's important to know about it. And uh, as you can see, uh, it is a lot of projects, uh, replications and registrations. This is a record support. We collaborated in a few um, projects. I think he has extensive uh, uh, expertise on uh, that. I hope you can learn a lot. I'm sure we will have more. So, good to all. And uh, I'm live and uh, Thank you for coming. For inviting me, okay. yeah, for me, a little bit of closure because five years ago I came here for an open science uh, workshop, right? And probably yeah. I think you were there as well. Um, and then I got to see Padova for the first time and also talk to a lot of people in open science and get some ideas for what I want my career to look like. So back then it was the first year, my assistant professor. I'm um, about to face the tenure committee, so time has passed. Um, and it's interesting that back then in 2018, I had a lot of ideas. We got a lot of ideas from people here in Southern Line, the Open Science Community. Chris Chambers was visiting here and gave some talks about register report, and people were a bit confused about so what is register report. And I was only starting my first register report with a very brave master's student. <laughs> So back then, 2018, I had a lot of doubts, uncertainties, a lot of things that I don't really know whether they're going to work out. And it's a little bit of a gamble as an assistant professor first year to say, okay, I'm going to do everything, try to do everything as best I can. Um, first in doing as much as I can all the time, trying to follow up on Chris with the register reports. Uh, to implement this in what was to me a relatively new domain, judgment decision making. I'll tell you a little bit why I chose that one. Uh, but also, and this is also something that you're all doing, I wanted to collaborate as much as possible. So in my PhD, my PhD is actually in management. I'm now in social psychology, but I grew up in a business school uh, where everybody, sorry, in a different university in Hong Kong. Okay. So I did the University in Hong Kong, and then I went to the US, then the Netherlands, and then a different university in Hong Kong invited me to come and join them as, uh, as faculty in a psychology department. So I transitioned. I did something that most people don't do. Sometimes people uh, kind of move uh, the other way from psychology to business. They usually never do that. You sacrifice 70% of your salary. <laughs> um, yeah, but also very important to collaborate and do mega, mega collaboration. It's a bit like what you've done, but it's really inspired work to get many people as you have to translate materials, to run this in their samples, aggregate this all together. Sometimes when I think about the scope and scale of what you've done, it's, uh, I want to do this kind of thing. It's very exciting, but I know how complex it is. So on one side, I wanted to do more open science, and then I wanted to do more uh, meta, meta science the large-scale uh, collaboration. Um, and 
judgment decision making is one area that I decided to move to. For that, I was in personal values and morality and a bunch, and my PhD was on the relating to free will. So very distant from judgment decision making, but when I was doing my postdoc, 2017, master of university in the Netherlands, I had to sit down with myself and ask, what research do I trust the most to work? Uh, and of all of the things that I've tried in many uh, countries in the world, so, uh, I grew up in Israel, and then I did uh, both blocks, U.S. and Netherlands, and then I, I had uh, affiliations in, in Hong Kong, and also in Taiwan. So in almost all of these countries, every time I would demonstrate judgment decision making, so like training, I could have this in you know, a classroom of 30 and 40, and it will always work out, right? If I run the other stuff on the living free will on the other things that I was doing, always works under the dozen effect as a little bit smaller. So I had the intuition that there's something about judgment decision making that seems not only to have larger effect size, um, but also seems to be fairly cross cultural uh, consistent uh, to, to hold in many in many contexts. So this is why I wanted to to move to German decision making. So 2018 was kind of like the first time I was moving into it. So one of the first things I wanted to but do so is try and replicate as many judgment and decision making uh, effects as possible to see if I want to build my research on that. So now wow. after five years, I can talk a little bit about this um, towards the end if you want. And there is an invitation for you if you want to join is that we've completed more or less 150 of these replications and extensions of various uh, of those uh, we have 80 that had regular pre-registration and data collection but um, more than 40 and for the last two years more and more of those we conduct as registered reports so today mostly i hope to share with you how we've done the registered report once. Uh, we can talk later. Uh, we'll have some time if you want. Uh, and I think we're staying for drinks or dinner. So we can talk about many projects that we have with data collection finished that you can come and take over and help us uh, to bring this to publication of those 80. Uh, but today I'll focus on the 40 plus and, and the things that we're doing as a, as a registered report to try and tell you why I think this is the future of science. From everything that I've seen from beginning to end, I really feel very strongly that this is first the right thing for me, second, the right thing for all the early career researchers and students working with me, and then more broadly of the whole community as the solution to many of the issues that we're uh, facing in, in science. So, I don't know all of your backgrounds. I don't know where you are with open science and register reports and what is it that you're doing. But if you have any questions during, you can feel free to just ask me, pause me, no problem. If I'm saying something that is unclear, just let me know. Um, and I'll try and I'll try and clarify this. It's important that you feel like you understand as we as we go through this. So if you want the slides, you can download the slides. So there's a barcode and uh, it will always appear like, uh, yeah, all on the, on the bottom over there. So you can always download this. Plus, hopefully this one as well. Every talk that I gave since the beginning of the pandemic, I used to be very shy about recording and very hesitant to say things publicly, but the pandemic helped me to gain some confidence and I just share it, sh start sharing everything. So all of my talks are on YouTube if you want to follow up and see some of the uh, other things. It's not only my talks and my research that I share publicly, but also my teaching courses. So if you're about to give a course on judgment decision making, for example, then I've been giving judgment decision making at University of Hong Kong, uh, explaining many of the like mental accounting, for example, you know, we have sessions on that. So you're welcome to take everything that I do. Also the stuff regarding open science. So there's judgment decision-making here and there's advanced social psychology. And we deal through these topics, we deal with the issues of open science and uh, why register reports are important. I'll just say the obvious because uh, I feel like in some places it still needs to, to, be, to be said. 
that we're facing lots of challenges. We just came out of a pandemic and then uh, we have climate change coming up and all sorts of other things like misinformation, AI and so forth. And we need credible science in order to address this. And we might disagree uh, between ourselves as a scientific community, what are the top uh, challenges? But uh, I think there's no doubt that one of the biggest uh, things that we can, uh, tools that we can have in order to address this is actually science. So um, last year, UNESCO came out with uh, open science. I used to feel like I need to convince people why they need open science, but now we no longer need this. Now they come to me and they say, okay, UNESCO said you need to do open science, how to do this. But also the G7, not too long ago, when uh, to my great surprise, when they talked about the science and technology, they say that we, they will promote open science in an official uh, declaration to adopt the fair principles. So to me, uh, we're living in times that I never thought that I'll see during my academic career. You know, for a decade, we've been trying to get people to do more open science. So I think us having a workshop on a registered report prepares you to what I think your careers are going to be on, you know, when you graduate your PhD, when you your post, you finish your postdoc, when you become a uh, tenure track tenured professors, this is what your career is going to be based on. This, these are the expectations from the world leaders and uh, generally across from across social. So Chris Chambers was here in 2018, so maybe I don't need to introduce too much, but he had a book in 2015 that kind of laid the foundations for this called Seven Deadly Sins of Psychology. We used to think that this is only in psychology, but I think since then we now understand this is not a psychology issue, this is a science issue. And uh, we've seen this most recently, I think the most shocking thing that came out was the cancer biology with a very, very low rates of rep uh, reproducibility. They wouldn't even be able, so they started with 193, but only 50 of those had enough materials and information in order to start a replication. And out of the 50 that they started, the replication rates for the reproduced uh, materials was very, very low, shockingly low. So it's not only just psychology. Now that we know that this is seven deadly sins of science overall. And we as judgment decision-making researchers have told the world you need to be careful because outcome bias, because hindsight bias, because mental accounting. But we never took a moment to realize that actually this also affects us. If there's outcome bias, hindsight bias, then us seeing the results of a paper actually biases us in order to evaluate the quality of what the paper is. So if p-value is higher than 0 0.05, then it's not good quality because they haven't done a good job. But you should not evaluate things based on outcome. And in hindsight, nothing seems surprising, right? So sometimes we can take judgment decision-making instead of studying others, we can study ourselves. So uh, all these things like confirmation bias, outcome bias, hindsight bias, we've known this as JDM scholars for a very long time. Now we need to understand that this also affects us and the way that we do science. So these are slides from um, uh, Chris Chambers. So I think it's an amazing paradox of academia and a little bit related to some of the recent scandals that just came out this week is that on the one side, there is a part of the study that should not be under our control. And these are the results. The results should reflect reality, not our wants and wishes. But the way that we are advancing our careers, the way that we get TED Talks, the way that we get uh, book deals is because of the, of the results. Where do we publish? How impact factor? How many publications? This is what creates all of these tensions. So on one side, you don't touch the results. But on the other side, you have to make the results amazing, right? And this is what creates an inherent conflict and a difference between what's best for science, which is high quality research that's published regardless of what the outcome is. If there is a vaccination for COVID-19, we want to know everything about this, not just the two that worked, but if there's 100 trials and only two worked, I want to know the 98 that didn't work in order to be able to assess that vaccination. I don't want you to just throw away all the 98 because those 98 are very important, as important as the two that actually worked. So if we just look two out of two, it seems like, okay, vaccination is amazing, but it could be that there's a lot of fog work. So what we want to have is the complete picture, regardless of what the outcome is. But what's best for us is to produce these great results and thereby creating a big tension where we're hired, promoted, get grants, 
based on factors that should not be under our control. And then it's no wonder that, you know, consciously or subconsciously, this affects us in all sorts of uh, bad ways. Um, this, I should have uh, updated this because it just finished this survey. But last week, just before I gave this uh, talk in Paris, uh, before coming here, I wanted to know uh, how do people hire because I had the intuition, first, I know that University, University of Hong Kong hires definitely based on impact factors, number of publications, number of external grants and all that. But I wanted to, to know where this is happening uh, everywhere in the world. So I ran some polls and I wanted to ask, so you have two candidates with the same number of publications, very sim similar qualifications. One emphasizes the impact factor, and the other one emphasizes the register report that we're going to talk about now. Who are you going to hire, the high impact factor or the person that does register reports? And you'll see that there is a very big bias, like 50% would say definitely impact factor. But there's lots of issues with that, and we're going to talk about some of these issues of uh, things that high impact factor journals are doing that is not good for science. So sometimes it's counter uh, science and has all sorts of the biasing. And then I also asked, do you emphasize high impact factor or do you emphasize transparency and openness practices, which is a new kind of like ranking for journals. So I definitely emphasize talk factor. So you have, we'll talk about this peer community in register reports, or you have meta psychology, you have all these journals that are very high on transparency. They Everything is open, everything is shared. Uh, and then you have, I don't know, science, uh, nature, and all that that are three pages long. If you ever try to reproduce something from a method section in science and nature, you can't because there is no method section. There's maybe a supplementary if they bother with this, but you can't based on three pages of a summary in a science. So high impact factor has uh, has a, an issue. So it's not only that this happens at my university, this is a phenomenon. Uh, a phenomenon that really happens across many places in the world. So this is just from this week, something that I ran very quickly on, on Twitter. Now it has, like, this is the 71 votes. It finished with like 300. So I know now that this is, it's very, very common in, in various places in the world. Once again, from Chris Chambers and, and Monafo from the UK, UK team, is that we have issues in every step of the way in the science uh, life cycle. Uh, we didn't have clear evidence for how bad things are up until 2011. So I don't know how familiar you are with social psychology being coming from judgment decision-making, but in JPSP, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, there's the famous case of BEM feeding the future, uh, where in a top publication, in the, one of the best journals, comes out this paper that goes against everything that we know from physics with somebody that claims to show nine experiments of people reacting to stimuli, pornographic stimuli that happens in the future. Uh, and once this came out, we were very confused by this. Like, what should we uh, make of this? Uh, and the way that we addressed trying to um, debunk this is that we said, okay, so BEM was able to show this with nine experiments. If we take everything that they did, um, you know, we verify this. Can you share the data? He shared the data. We couldn't see anything wrong with it. How do we know whether this holds or not? Let's do a replication. So we tried to do one replication, two replications, three replications. People are still doing replications of BEM. I don't know why. Investing millions in this sort of thing, but the replications failed. So and then we had an issue getting these into journals. So Stuart Ritchie, who wrote science fictions and actually left academia uh, to be a science writer, um, tried to get his publication also to JPST and was uh, rejected. It only took the Data Colada uh, team to be able to get this into JPST a year, a year later. But the original one from them is still out there. Like if you ask people, you know, the lay, the community, the lay audiences. What do you think about this? Yeah, it's published in a, in a journal, therefore it must be true. Nobody actually looks at the, at the replications. So one of the questions that we had in 2012 is that how many replications are we actually doing? If BEM doesn't replicate, did we ever try and replicate anything else? Uh, and the first thing that came out in 2012 is that only one in 1,000 uh, papers ever gets uh, published. 
I recently did an update on this. So Simin Vazir, who uh, is the current editor, chief editor of Collabra Psychology, did a project, a meta science project, looking at this now. And she has statistics of 0.2%, 0.2%. So only one in 500 is being replicated in psychology. I, we looked at uh, summaries from education, from sociology, from criminology. The rates are somewhere between 0.1 to 5% is the highest. But it just means that we're not doing any replications. So already we're failing this kind of the first uh, step over here. Up until not too long ago, we also didn't have enough power. So uh, up until some disciplines like management, the business store, still have you know, 20 in each condition, 40 in each condition, don't do power analysis, but very low power uh, in, in, many of the, in many of the studies. And then uh, in 2012, we started mapping questionable research practices, all sorts of things that people do in order to push the p-value just below 0 0.05. And I remember the first pushback is like, what do you mean people are doing this? How, how do you know people are doing this? You're claiming people are doing this. So the same people, Data Colada, people came out with a paper in 2011, false positive psychology, saying that actually, if you uh, play a little bit with, uh, if you try more and more ways in order to analyze the data, you're almost guaranteed to get significant results. And now we have shiny apps. I have a brand with statisticians and says, uh, with statistics, you can always yeah. prove an hypothesis. Of course, some methods are uh, correct and some are wrong, but uh, in some way, you will always be able to prove the points. So, yeah. Uh, so now we have simulations showing this. One of the nice things about the R, R Markdown, R Shiny App revolution is that everybody can very easily show simulations. So I demonstrate uh, how to p hack. Uh, I show this to my students. Some people are saying, why well, don't should not show this to anybody because then they'll do it. But I think it's very important that we understand what people are doing so that we'll know not to do this or what the implications of this are. So for example, with Bem, it seemed like what he was doing, he was not fabricating data or anything like that. He was doing a lot of optional stopping without adjusting for alpha. So without reducing the alpha for every time you peak. So you bring in a participant, uh, you see if p-value is lower than 0 0.05, oh, still not, okay, next participant, lower than 0 0.05, oh, still not. And once you do this enough times, then because of the dance of the p-values, they go up, they go down, the randomness of the universe, eventually you'll have a significant result, and then you stop. So, okay, now I found that p-value lower than 0 0.05. So we ask people, are you doing these things? And this is one thing that replicates every year since 2012. It's like 50 to 100% say either that they're doing this or that they know that others in the department are doing this. Right? Um, and then also the other things. And then finally, at the end, publication bias. And we just don't share data. I, this is something that I really don't understand how we can claim that this is not a religion or a trust system, but this is science. How can you, as a reviewer, I will not review papers unless I have access to the data and the code. Otherwise, what am I doing? Am I just reading the introduction and taking this at face value? I, want, I really want to see what is happening over there. Maybe I won't catch anything uh, or everything, but at least I'll know. And it's, it's public property. The taxpayers paid for my salary and for the research. I don't understand. I'm saying, no, this is mine. Can't share this. If you need to de-identify, if you need, if you have some kind of uh, other concerns, you can do synthetic data sets of the same properties and have a third party uh, say that they're the same. So there's no reason not to share something or some of it, at the very least, the, the code in a synthetic data set. Um, so we have all these problems. So the question is like, where do we uh, start with this? And my claim is that, and Chris Chambers made the same claim in 2018 here, is that register reports are the way to do this. So this actually started with Chris Chambers in 2013. So Cortex reached out to Chris Chambers. This is a journal in neuroscience and said, can you please come and join the editorial team? But Chris Chambers was already very disheartened by everything that he was seeing in science, all hindsight bias and outcome bias and everything uh, that he wrote in his book. So he said, the only way that I will join the editorial board is if you'll let me do a new kind of publication. And now that he reflects, uh, you know, it's been 10 years, a decade. So in the last Meta Science Conference, he reflects on the kind of 
pushback that he got from the other editors in Cortex that they said that uh, should not be allowed to do this and that this is anti-science and all that just seems very ridiculous a decade after because this is really one of the biggest revolutions. And the, the idea is very, very simple. So we already have the idea of a pre-registration because we don't want to fool ourselves. So we write down everything about our plans. What is it that we plan to do? We do a power analysis, so we know what the expected sample size is. We know all the analysis, what we're aiming to do step by step. This is great. And I think already in 2013, people were starting to do this on their own. Uh, I, I know a decade later, people are still struggling to do a pre-registration. So for example, when I visit uh, Paris, some of them are still like, can you show us how is this? How do you do this? Some people do pre-registration, but they do this very, very badly where they don't specify things enough. So they maintain the kind of flexibility. Some people do pre-registrations, but then they deviate from that and they don't document their deviations. They just, we did the pre-registrations, but then we ended up doing something completely different, right? And then we don't have a way of really uh, being able to track Let's say I'm a reviewer on a paper and somebody said, okay, we pre-registered and then it comes as predicted. I don't know if you've ever used this tool, but it's basically five, six questions that people answer with one sentence. And then as a reviewer, I look at the pre-registration like, what is the connection between this and the manuscript that I just saw? I don't know how to connect between these two. So Chris Chambers said, instead of you doing this on your own, write a really good pre-registration that would be easy for an external reviewer to understand and to evaluate and to help you with this so that as a community, the editor, the reviewers, and the authors can together discuss whether this is the best plan. In order to be able to discuss whether this is the best plan, it needs to be very detailed. You cannot do five questions, six questions on as predicted. It needs to be highly specified. And the reviewers make sure that it's constrained enough so that it can be evaluated against what you did at the end. So this is the first revolution. You take the pre-registration, and instead of doing this on your own, you send this out to external peer review. The second revolution, and this is really a change of mindset for everybody in the field, is that once everybody agrees that this is the best plan, outcomes should not matter. How to do this? Once everybody agrees that this is the best plan, the journal says, here is an in-principle acceptance. No matter what the outcome is, what the data is, we will publish these results. P-value lower than 0 0.05, higher than 0 0.05, it doesn't matter. We will publish it. So no more outcome bias. Takes care of all the hindsight bias because reviewers do not evaluate you based on the results. It's not about how surprising the results are. It's about how good your plan is. So in-principle acceptance based on a pre-registration plan is really a change of mindset. When I share this with my students, you know, I'm very proud of this change of mindset. And I tell my students, isn't this amazing? And they look at me very confused. It's like, isn't this the way science that always worked? It's like, why hasn't it worked this way? And I'm just amazed that we created this weird system where we evaluate everything together at the end. So for undergraduates, when I explain this to them, it's very intuitive that this is the way science should be. Why would you need outcomes? But to us who have been brainwashed with the traditional system of just submitting at the end, for us, this is a big uh, shift in mindset. And the reason why there's a lot of clash between open science people and the traditional journals is because they've been brainwashed with this. But if you ask somebody, now we have surveys and some publications showing that when you ask people in the street, which one of those makes more sense to you? Everybody says register reports just seems like what science should be like. So this is the broken uh, model and it's broken because you end up writing everything. When you reach the stage where you write the report, if you really end up writing the report, it's like first you have results and then you make a decision. Do I want to write this? Do I want to submit this? Maybe it's a waste of my time. Maybe it's not good enough for science and nature and PNAS. Therefore, put this in a file drawer and forget about it, right? So already a lot of the funding, the money, and the trust that we got from the taxpayers, we failed that trust because we did something, but we failed to report this. Sometimes we feel like we're going to get rejected 
for our findings. So we say it's not worth our time. We are already afraid of being evaluated based on the results. Oh, we didn't get the value load in 0.05. They're going to reject us. Why even bother? You know, I don't have the time for this. I'll just run this, you know, run something different that have higher chances of you know, having p-value lower than 0.05. So we have a file drawer problem, but we have an even bigger publication bias problem where we first get uh, evaluated by the editor, whether this is amazing enough for their journal because they are evaluated in order to get impact factors. They're evaluated by how big of a media attention they might get. You know? So already they evaluate you based on your hypothesis and other better, especially uh, the results. Is this going to make a big change? Then they send this to reviewers. The reviewers can have the same kind of biases. Another thing that can happen is that they can come from an opposite camp. So let's say uh, mental accounting uh, and behavioral economists sending this to an economist's journal. An economist is like, what is this stuff? You're putting psychology stuff in our amazingly uh, clear, um, rational uh, publications? Of course not. Let's That's just... many times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So coming in with a new paradigm, even if it affects the uh, phenomenon, it's like it goes against the establishment. And if you talk to Nobel Prize winning uh, people, most of them have been rejected by uh, journals, even though at the end, they published this at the third tier journal, but at the end, this ended up having a Nobel Prize winning um, phenomenon because it was so anti the, the norm. So we just have a lot of things going on here, which to me just means that this is broken. So this is the new uh, model suggested. So in the stage one, you just submit the plan. And the only thing that you should be evaluated on is whether you specified things clearly enough. So you've had the research question, you've had the hypothesis, you've had the data analysis and all that. And then once this is uh, outlined, um, do, do they make sense? Are the hypothesis well articulated? Is it well founded? Is it goes you know, uh, with some falsifiable theory that you can see every claim, whether we're going to uh, find support for it or, or reject? Um, uh, we can establish things like, uh, is it well-powered enough? And then we can have all kinds of different controls in order to make sure that it's specified well enough in order for us to be able to gain some kind of understanding from, from the results. Stage two, which happens after the in-principle acceptance. So uh, after stage one, once you all agree in-principle acceptance, you can already take this, put this on your CV and say, I have a guaranteed publication form cortex. So uh, there's something about this where you've accomplished something. You got an uh, agreement from the editor and the reviewers that you had a good plan. And then you can proceed further. The only thing that should happen in, uh, in stage two is that they make sure that you follow the plan, the pre-registration plan in the first, uh, in stage one. Or if you deviated, and it's completely okay to deviate, it's completely okay to add an additional analysis, that you make sure that it's clear that these are new. So separating what it is that you predicted and then following that plan. And then if you deviated or added something new, then document this very, very clear so people can have a good understanding of what is uh, conformatory and what is exploratory. And if it's exploratory, then we'll need to do another follow-up in order to establish that this is really holding. But the most important thing here is about transparency. So it's okay for you to explore as much as you want and do whatever it is that you want, but then you're very clear about what happened in stage one, what happened in stage two. So the reviewers, and I'll show you some examples. The only thing that they need to do is you look at the plan in stage one and then you compare what you've done in stage two to that. And then it's very, very easy. You don't take as predicted six questions and then you try to somehow map this. Everything should be mappable to uh, one another. So from this broken model where we have a lot of problems, we basically take care of all of this because there is no publication bias. There is no problems with uh, you know, hindsight bias, outcome bias. You can ensure things like uh, statistical power. So one of the issues here is that if in the traditional model, the reviewers have something to say here, it's already too late because it's been conducted, right? So this shifts um, the reviewing to be something that's a lot more community-based. It's a lot more constructive because actually this is a stage where if there is a problem, 
that's great. Thanks for pointing this out. I'm going to fix it rather than everybody being against each other. So reviewers trying to go against authors and then it's kind of like a battle. So uh, you can take care of things like statistical power. So if you think you were well-powered enough, but the reviewer sees some problem with this, for example, a common thing that I see is that people do a power analysis and then they say, yeah, and then we look at an interaction. But an inter interaction, a moderation, definitely a mediation, definitely a moderated mediation <laughs> adds a lot of constraints that lower power significantly. And many people don't take this into account. They say, oh, we have this main effect. We had an interaction. We just you know, uh, need to do this slight, slight compensation. But sometimes moving into an interaction means a lot higher. Sometimes you need to go as high as 10 times more in order to power this to find an interaction. And most people don't have a good understanding of this. Now we have shiny apps and we have tools, but many times it's not statistically powered enough. So in my business school, when I did my PhD, a lot of mo moderation, mediation, multi-level, 60 participants. It's impossible to find anything like this. And if somebody found something like that, I would bet that this is heavily, luck. sorry? It's luck. Luck is one way to put it. I would bet on something else. I know there's a very big uh, file drawer. Maybe yeah. maybe they've tried this again and again, and uh, then they, or absolutely. questionable research practices. Uh, but this used to be very common. We didn't know the implications of, the, of these things. How many journals are supporting this? Uh, over 300 uh, different journals. So I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So it started from Cortex and the three uh, journals that Chris was editor on. But now it's uh, it's going uh, higher and higher. Uh, have any of you been involved in a register report? Somebody, yeah, you have. Wait, which journal did you submit to? Uh, it was um, Royal Society. The Royal Society, yeah. So I think Chris was the person uh, bringing it to Royal Society of Open Science, yeah. Yeah, so he's, he was an editor. That's one of the first three uh, three journals. And they did a lot of very interesting things. So for example, they were among the first to say, if you have a replication of anything that has been published in the literature, we will publish this. We just want, a, we want replication. Somebody should publish replications. So Royal Society of Open Science is, if you have replications and you don't know where to submit, Royal Society of Open Science was one of the first to say, we, we're definitely interested in this. And because they had uh, a little bit of uh, an initial uh, impact factor, so people are like, oh, finally, replication. We have somewhere to publish. Yeah. What was the end result with the register report? Completed? Oh, well, in process? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, okay. So I'll just show you. I'll open this because you might want to know first uh, which journals are available. And then if you have a few journals with register report, which one should you go for, right? So two major links that you should uh, keep track of. Uh, both, uh, the first one is by the Center of Open Science. So uh, the team that is behind the Open Science Framework that does really holy work in the area of open science. And the second one is actually from Cardiff, uh, the same university where Chris Chambers is. So these two are really uh, pushing uh, the boundaries of what is happening with registry one. So if we just open the first link, yeah. So what you can see here is that we have the list of all the journals and by now we have like a lot of those and somebody is trying to keep track of all of these things. And then you can see that it has, uh, for example, a scientific discipline, uh, whether they support replication. So if you want to do a replication register report, you can filter uh, by this. Uh, not all of them support a meta-analysis. So we've done um, three register reports for meta-analysis, and then you really need to go for journals that know how to support a meta-analysis a meta -analysis as a register report. So you can uh, see which ones are supportive of this. So only 130 out of, I don't know, uh, more uh, 500 uh, are supportive of meta-analysis. So just take this into consideration. Uh, if you're doing qualitative research, I don't know, uh, but some journals are supportive of this, but not many, only 22 uh, are supportive of Qualitative research, uh, some of them demand access to data. If you care about impact factors and H index, so you can also filter based on this. Um, this is important, I think, for early career researchers. I don't have 
funding. I really failed at getting any funding whatsoever for my research. All of my research is done with uh, teaching, uh, teaching funding. So I don't have uh, any money to cover APCs, to cover fees for open access. So you might want to filter based on uh, whether there's APCs or look at whether they have waivers. Usually they do for early career researchers. Um, yeah, our you. university also has a lot of agreements. Has agreements. Okay, that's great. Um, okay, so that's the first one I wanted to show you. The second one I want to show you, let's say that you have a few options that you're considering, but you want to know which is the best option. So this is where you go to the second one. And this is a new initiative. It's only been running for about four months, but they already have enough in there to try and evaluate the journals based on two factors. Um, so if we go over here to the dashboards, you'll see that you have speed, how speedy they are, and then you have quality. Uh, they have different measures for quality. So if you look at quality, we're gonna be talking about this one, peer community and register reports which is what I recommend and what I've started to implement with all of my thesis students. Um, and then following is the Royal Society of Open Science. So it's just the behind us. So all, like, all of these are initiatives where Chris Chambers is involved. So it would make sense that they have the most experience in implementing registry reports. Um, another one that we've used a lot is Collaborative Psychology, not so much for registry reports, but it's just a very open science supportive Journal, so Samin Vazir really did some uh, good stuff over there. We had uh, one register report. So the first one that I ever tried was with comprehensive results in social psychology. So I should do this. Yeah. So it's this one over here. Yeah. So comprehensive results in social psychology. Um, yeah, and uh, there's actually some pretty high impact factor places here. If this is what you care about, your need for your career, so nature, human behavior, even though it's nature, uh, this is the one in nature that actually implemented it. So let's say you want to know a little bit about that. Um, that's actually a lot, 404. Wow. Okay. So um, you can see all the ratings about speed and quality and all sorts of additional questions. So it's a really good way for you to choose a target. If you want to start and you want to increase your chances of getting registered report right, then go here and plan this accordingly. And my suggestion to you as an early career researcher is that you start from the ones that are the highest here on quality and on speed and get good reviews from the people who use these registered reports so that you get some good experience before, let's say you go to, if you care about impact factors, all the others with like, I don't know, nature, human behavior and all that, just to gain some experience from that. So I really recommend this website to start from that. Right. Any, any questions about this so far? Is it clear? It's pretty straightforward, right? Okay. Yeah. Uh, the science pyramid. So this is something that uh, Chris Chambers uh, advocates. So I really think now when I read research that is not a registry report and doesn't have any data sharing, doesn't have a pre-registration, um, and I see all the media attention and I see that people immediately start to implement this in all kinds of policy. To me, that should not inform policy. To me, this is just the beginning of a journey of us figuring this out as a field to try and see whether this holds or not. So before we jump into implementing policy, for example, you need to sign um, honesty pledges at the beginning of the page instead of at the, at the end of the page, which has been implemented by Obama administration and the behavioral insights team in the UK. We really should try this again and again in order to see whether this really uh, holds or not. So the status quo uh, research down here at the bottom should really not inform policy and we should really be very cautious before we go to media and announce this. But as we move up in open science and especially as we get to register report, we're starting to see a little bit of green rather than red. That's when we can really start to say all sorts of things because we know that it has followed all the best practices of open science taking away all the publication bias, outcome bias, outside bias, and so forth. And hopefully in a decade, we'll have a meta-analysis of registered reports rather than a meta-analysis with a huge publication bias that we don't know how to adjust for. 
Uh, I added two more layers to Chris's uh, um, kind of pyramid. I also think that a meta-analysis should be a registered report. If you want to know how to do this, we have templates. I will show you this on my website. So we worked together. So there's two early career researchers that work with me in order to have a good template for how to conduct uh, meta-analysis as a registered report. You can also conduct a systematic review as a registered report. So first layer here is that meta-analysis of registered report should also be a registered report. And then hopefully with time, it would be also continuously updated. Uh, one of the persons who I'm working with, Lucas, actually created this for replications. So every time a new replication comes in, it automatically updates a Shiny app that shows you the latest of uh, meta-analysis meta of reg registry reports, and you can flag which ones, uh, sorry, of replications, and you can flag which ones are registered reports. So you can have automatically continuously updated um, meta-analysis of registry reports. So that's, to me, the future of, of science. Now, and I think this is perhaps an important point for especially early career researchers, like, okay, so we understand why this is good for science. Why is it good for us as authors? Because it seemed almost like there is a clash between what is good for science and what is good for authors. But I think now we already know after a decade of registry reports that it's also good for us as, as authors. And this has definitely been my, my experience uh, with this. So first of all, it helps you to just do good science. So there's no stress over the amazing and significant. You don't feel like you need to clash with, you know, whether you need to produce something that you can't uh, really have control over. The amazing thing that I think every time, uh, even, even today, uh, yesterday, I, we had a, a new decision letter. Uh, so constructive, positive, expert feedback when it's most useful. So uh, the reviewers really find mistakes. In, in our plans. Uh, I have been doing replications for a, a while now and we've completed many replications and I'm still learning a lot from the reviewers and they uh, really do a very good job because we actually try to be as transparent as possible. So for example, we do this, many don't, but I really recommend that you do this. We simulate data. For stage one, we create, so we use everything with Qualtrics. Qualtrics has this amazing thing that says, please simulate a thousand participants. We take that simulation and we write the data analysis code on that simulated data. This means that the reviewers can see everything that we're going to analyze as if it's the real data. So of course, because it's simulated random data, everything is non-significant and there's no effects whatsoever. Uh, actually, if we see effects, we know something is wrong and we messed up the Qualtrics, maybe they coded this wrong. So this is a good way to check. But then the amazing thing is that the reviewers, when they have the simulated data in our code, they run this and they help us improve. Some of the reviewers even help us improve by doing equivalence testing and Bayesian testing, which we we're not planning. So I'm saying, okay, please just do Bayesian. And we already added the code for you. So here, I'm like, this is, this is amazing. So really constructive expert feedback and they help you. Sometimes I feel their uh, feedback is so good that I really want to make them uh, co-authors, which I can't. But one of the solutions is coming, I'll show this to you with peer community where they get credit by having open peer review that is citable. So they can put on their CV, we contributed and everybody can see what it is that they added to our uh, manuscript. So this is as good as it gets to get credit as a, as a reviewer. So to me, this, this alone, just the second one is already just amazing. Yeah. No, I, I really want to understand. And, and also it's great for replication, even better for uh, original studies because a lot of original studies, they are rejected. Not because they do this bad many times, but uh, because you have confounding factors that you could have control and probably ask you for, you know, collecting new data. And, uh, you know, you can avoid most of these things. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, so always, you know, when they reject the paper, it's, it's bad, but uh, sometimes it's even worse when you do a big study and they tell you, you know, you should collect more data, new study, check to do that. 
you can apply doing that, that would be amazing. You know, you could register, yeah. you do the register the report, you discuss with the reviewers. And uh, uh, I think it's a common experience for all of us that if you discuss with your authors, they will spot a lot of things that you didn't see. And, uh, and the reviewers are outside of the thinking process. So it's even easier to see things from a different perspective and tell you, well, maybe that part should be strengthened more. And it's, uh, well, I'll say it now, but I don't, I don't want to take much time. But one of the things I like of the register of reports is, especially for original studies, also for, for, uh, for replication as yet, but, you know, it's difficult to interpret the null results. Uh, but if it's a, a register of report you have already discussed with the reviewers, you probably have put in place all the, the things you need make those newer results meaningful. Yeah. Uh, you know, all the control, all the confounding factors right. and support. And therefore, it's really useful to have these data found. You right. know, if you do a regular registration, you're not ensured that uh, it's going to be published even if it's more the results. Because yeah. maybe you just can mess up with the with the with the meters, you didn't see the company. Yeah. So that's that's very invaluable. Yeah. Since you brought it up, I'll also say that it has been a big change for us uh, doing replications as register reports because especially the first few years, the first two years, when I uh, submitted some of the replication reports with data collection to, especially with failed replications to journals and they invited the original authors, we got some very, very hostile uh, mm -hmm. reviews which basically are just like reject. This is bad. This is bad. This doesn't. And, and we we still we still get some of those, but when they're invited as reviewers uh, for register reports, sometimes they're hostile about this whole thing about who who are you? How dare you replicate my uh, uh, findings? Uh, but sometimes they're just like very uh, grateful, and whatever concerns they have, you can uh, address this. I think they're also a lot more careful to predict failure in advance because that would actually reflect badly on them. So this also helps with all sorts of concerns. So definitely for original reports, definitely for re uh, replication reports, there's so many benefits from this that has really changed my perspective. Um, I have to say that some of the re um, reviews were so hostile that I, I uh, mostly or only do replications with early career researchers and students. So. I was really concerned about showing them how their idols from the textbooks uh, are doing reviews. It's really it's like um, really shameful, really shameful stuff. When you do register reports, there's uh, there's an incentive uh, not not to be as hostile. Um, I think these are counterintuitive to people. Higher acceptance rate, what does it mean? So I'll tell you, for example, in my PhD, I submitted to mostly management journals, most of the, and, and you only go for the top five. So AMJ, JAP, I forgot all the, the OBHDP, can't remember all that. Um, and their rejection rate is something between 90 to 95%. This is like how how difficult it is to, and coming from a place, first of all, all of us are not, or I guess most of us are not native speaker English. So that's already a barrier. We come from a place that's not considered to be the Ivy League uh, top, uh, even though Padova is like the, the oldest university. It's like they don't, when they look at, <laughs> when they look at University of Hong Kong, it's like already we know this is not good. You know, there's all kinds of biases come, come into uh, into play. So it's very difficult for us to compete when there's 99 uh, to 95%. So I can tell you that our rejection rate when we submitted replications with data collection the regular way, our rejection rate is between 60 to 70%, I would say. Can you imagine just how many rejections that is? <laughs> it's just an insane amount of rejections and hostility. What's our rejection rate with register reports? Do you want to guess? It's zero. <laughs> there's no way. There's just no reason for you to reject a manuscript if you can fix it, right? So it's such a relief to go from 70%, 60% to go to zero. Like there's no reason to reject it because you can work on the problems together. 
So to me, it's just unbelievable. Uh, Chris says from Cortex and some of the other things that he has edited, it went down from like 90% to about 10%. And the 10% rejection rates is just people that don't understand what is a registry report. So they didn't follow the template or they didn't do this correctly. So just for your own sakes and your well-being, you know, just the sanity of remaining in academia and staying positive, this is already like a big, a big step. One of the things that people are concerned about is how fast is this? Um, in the beginning, I really thought, you know, if you have to do more rounds on the pre-registration plan, it might take forever. And some of the students have like one year MPhil, two years MPhil, the PhD, three year. I don't know how many years you have funding, but it's a very limited time and you're already under a lot of constraints. And the last year of the PhD, you're already on the job market. So all this pressure is like, I need to get there on time. But actually the first person who tried this with me, an MPhil student, Chin Yu, who's now, I just visited him like a month ago in Vienna. Um, he's now a PhD student in Vienna. So his MPhil was two years and uh, we really, I was, I was prepared for this to take more than three years. He finished the entire register report with a journal, Comprehensive Results in Social Psychology within one year. So actually everything was very straightforward because once we got the in principle acceptance, actually we ran the data collection, we plugged it into the R markdown Immediately, everything came out, just updated the results, and then added a discussion, and that was it. And the stage two, instead of being this, like, a lot of back and forth, and it's like, oh, good plan, great, approved. Like, oh, wow, magic. This never happened to me uh, before. And I'll show you some of this, how this happens to us in peer community in registered reports. So I really um, advise this, but even with Chinu, uh, even I was worried that it might take a very long time. I already was, um, my concerns were addressed by the fact that I said at least he will have the in principle acceptance on his CV so that he can find a, a PhD based on that because it is a guaranteed publication. So if, even if you're just very good at doing plans and you're not very good with all the data collection and managing, especially if it's multi-country and all that, just do the best plan that you can you already have in principle acceptance, have this on your CV, and then you're ready to go for the next place in your PhD. You can then do the plan that you said you're going to do. Another thing that I did not take into account is funding. Um, our, our funding, I don't know about here, is like a lottery ticket. It's I don't know, 5%, 3%. It's very, very difficult. But if you have an in principle acceptance, Funders love this. It's like, oh, we don't have to bet on you. We already know this is going to get published. Of course, we'll like, like to do this. <clears throat> so now I'm going to show this to you at the end. The university, if there is a student that does a thesis with me and we show an in-principle acceptance, the university funds up to 1,000 US dollars for the data collection. Because we do all the data collection on Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific or some one of these labor markets, then that should be enough for our experiments that are three to five minutes to have a sample of something like seven, 800. So already this is a very well powered sample for a main effect for a student. So they don't have to worry about, you know, a year of collecting data. But of course this works in JDM because we're very lucky. We can play with choice sets and a very simple vignette so we can run this. But it also helps with, uh, with all of that. Um, a little bit, there's more uh, increasing evidence that register reports really have, um, is working. So dropping from an impossible 90 plus percent of positive results. So p-value lower than 0 0.05 in the standard reports is, is very, very high, un unreasonably high. But with register reports, it drops to lo lower than 50%, which seems, seems about reasonable. And uh, we see more and more support for this sort of thing. This is the closest that we've had to a randomized control trial where people only evaluated uh, reports without knowing whether they're regular reports or if they're register reports. Uh, and uh, we're randomly assigned either to uh, review this or review that. And then without knowing whether what they're reviewing is a register report or not, uh, they concluded that register reports were higher on method or quality of methods, uh, how much we're going to learn on analysis rigor, conclusion justified, and overall quality of the paper. This is a quite large effect diet. So it seems like even people who do not know whether a register report was a register report seem 
to evaluate this as higher quality. And it, it really makes sense because if you had all sorts of issues, you could have addressed them in the stage, in the same one. So if you want to read more about this, just recently, I think three or two years ago, uh, Chris summarized all his journey, like a decade of this, uh, of this thing. And he addresses all the misconceptions and realities of registry boards that if you want, if you have questions, we can talk about some of the things that you worry about. But he's really addressing all sorts of things. So for example, people say, but because of registry reports, I cannot explore. Quite the contrary. You can explore as much as you want. You just need to be very transparent about this. So registry reports do not hinder exploration. They just make it clear that you've explored this rather than claiming after the fact that actually you found support for your hypothesis. It doesn't limit creativity. Uh, you can even do not just a single shot. Or you can do more than that. So you can go and, and read this. Also, as a reviewer, I have to say that I much prefer to be a reviewer for registry reports because then I can really have an impact and I can contribute something rather than if I'm faced with a, like a manuscript. And the only thing I can do, and sometimes I do this, I say certain things need to be fixed. I have not rejected the manuscript in uh, five years. But I would say, I think additional data collection is needed, but I please ask that we give them in principle acceptance so that we don't, uh, so in a regular journal, I'm trying to convert regular journals to become register reports saying, even if data collection is needed and we need to fix a few things, please give them in principle acceptance so that if they'll collect this data, that it wouldn't rely on, on the outcome. And some journals have been um, uh, willing to do this. We've also converted a few of the traditional journals to register reports. So when they asked us, so for example, SPPS, uh, social personality, psychological science, something like that. Uh, social psychology and personality science. Yeah. Uh, they have like a twist with the SPPS uh, stuff. Um, we got um, a request. So we submitted a replication with the data collection. And the reviewer, the editor, who is the same editor, chief editor of comprehensive results of social psychology, I told him, you're an editor in another journal that only accepts register reports. So I'm please asking you, you want us to collect data? I'm very willing to collect this data if you will grant us an in-principle acceptance within a journal that does not do a register report. And he said, yeah, I'm willing to do this. So then we collected the data. The data showed something. It doesn't matter what it showed. Then it was automatically accepted for publication. So we've, we've done this with two different uh, journals. So that's also a possibility for you. If you get rejected uh, or if somebody says you need additional data collection, they say, I'm very willing to correct this. These are good comments. Good job. But please, I ask that if I do this, please grant me an in-principle acceptance. And some editors are increasingly uh, willing, willing to do this especially if they come from the open science community. So that's something for you to consider. Um, yeah, so that's what I did with uh, Chinyu. Uh, we did actually with a, a replication of decoy effect. I really thought this is gonna be a no problem, no brainer, but it really wasn't. Uh, so this ended up being a mostly failed replication, uh, but it in comprehensive results in social psychology. I'm bringing this up here because I asked Chinyu to summarize his experience for you. We're not gonna go over this whole text, but I summarize this. Summary is, he says, um, so from all this text, if it summarizes the different section, it really reduces the uncertainty. Uh, you get more opportunity and we caught some problems in design because of our reviewers. So thankful for that, saves time, which is, uh, we really thought it's gonna take more than two years, less than one year. And I really like this because this is a summary for you. I strongly recommend early career researchers and research students to do registry reports. Uh, so uh, that's something for you to consider. Okay. Before I move on to peer community and registry reports, which I think is the biggest revolution that we've had, uh, it goes beyond. It's people refer to this as registered reports 2.0. Any questions about register reports or things that are on your mind or things that you think that we should discuss? Was it clear? Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty straightforward, yeah. Okay, good. So I, I was wondering, uh, yes. uh, with let's say regular journal, yeah. okay, with the regular procedure, 
sometimes it happens that uh, the reviewer asks you more than what is, uh, uh, let's say, legitimate to ask, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, they really want you to cite their work or they really want you to uh, follow, in a sense, their feedback, and they are not always very constructive, yeah. let's say, or not strictly related to what you are um, discussing in your work. Yeah. Is this something that uh, happened also in the registered uh, report? Yeah, or for sure. It's, oh, okay, so. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, the same thing. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I the... that they were more... Uh, so, so it depends, it depends. I think uh, the more traditional people are, um, the more they're going to be like that. I think the biggest issues that we've had about this were with original authors mm -hmm. uh, whose work we try to replicate coming in as reviewers on registry reports and just asking us to do things that we think are uh, impossible. So, for example, they would say things like, uh, we replicated this on a, you know, a sample of 30 in Princeton in the 1970s, but you're going to run this on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Please find first the Princeton sample, go back in time to 1970 and run this again. And I'm like, I don't, that's not like a viable thing because in your paper, you did not write this only works in the 1970s on this sample of 30 Princeton students. You have, TED Talks and books saying that this works for everybody else in the world all the time. You have a whole career built on this. Therefore, at the very least, I think that this will generalize to an Amazon Mechanical Turk um, sample. However, sometimes we're willing to find a middle, a middle way. So for example, they would say, there's something specific about this that we think is more applicable to students. And I'm like, great. I will do a filter on Amazon Mechanical Turk or Prolific where I'm going to have a filter saying I'm only running this on students. That I am willing to do. Some people say maybe you need to filter for certain states or you need uh, something uh, specific about the context of California. So we didn't write this in the paper, but now we think that maybe five decades later it needs to be. And I'm like, okay, just take into consideration that you're actually limiting the general generalizability of, of the findings. So I'm trying to take what seems to be reasonable and find some solutions that would help us. Sometimes I use a moderator, you know, so mm -hmm. for example, um, if it's a student sample, I say, I'm really curious if this generalizes beyond students. So I'm just going to ask if they're students or not. I'm going to have this as a flag, and then I'm going to add this as a covariate exploratory exploratory analysis at the end. So some things are unreasonable, and then you need a good editor to support you to say, okay, definitely not going back in time to the 1970s, right? Sometimes there are some things that you say, okay, now I can add a, a moderator. Sometimes, for example, some people are saying you need to randomize the order of every possible choice and then add a moderator for every one of those randomizations for the order of this one and the order of that one. And like, it's unreasonable because first of all, you haven't done that, right? So you, this, this is part of the, of the problems in the original design. We're not meant to do this sort of thing. But if I see something that might be relevant or somehow is related to theory, I will try and address this. Uh, in pure community and registry report, I think it's partially addressed because, and this is really important, this is why I love peer community. Editors need the right kind of training. Some journals tell you we support registered reports, but actually, in fact, the editors are so old school, they don't understand First of all, what is register reports? And then more broadly, what is open science and what is it for? Peer community in register reports trains the editors. They actually go through an exam to make sure that they know what is open science and what is a register report. Yeah, I think it's great because uh, even with the status quo, you write your paper, you submit, you receive comments you don't have to respond to all these comments, right? You can argue with the reviewers and say, oh, I think this is not very reasonable or this is out of the scope of the paper, whatever, you know? Right. And, uh, um, and I have a feeling that in many cases, the editors 
in status where they they don't take any decision. They let the reviewers. Right. And if the reviewers are not completely fine with the paper, get rejected. Uh, we had experience where we collected new data, it came out exactly as the reviewers wanted, and the reviewers said, "Ah, oh, but there is some yeah, rejected." So it's crazy, right? Or well, they and, even invite a new reviewer that wasn't yeah. there before, and now he has new comments or she has new comments. They they, they really don't take any. Uh, responsibility, responsibility, right? Right. And in this case, they are placed in a position where they have to take responsibility. Yes. Because uh, it's uh, if if they the reviewers ask you to do ton of stuff, yeah, some irrelevant or not so important. Uh, in the end, is the the response is the editor that asks you to do that. Right. So uh, it's clearly their responsibility. They cannot say well, it's just the reviewer, you know, and then. Uh, in a sense, so I think, and it's important to, to train them. Okay? Yes, uh, yes. I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, it's not a job for everybody to be an editor. Yes. And uh, if you don't, if you don't have the uh, the ability to take a responsibility. Uh, yeah. And, I think also as a community, and also in journals, we did not take enough responsibility. Yeah in helping the reviewers give good feedback. So this open-ended, give review on whatever you feel like, just read it and give me like a free text. So actually peer community in registry reports has very clear criteria. Please comment on this, but do not comment on that, right? So it makes it very, very clear that at the very least you will have comments on these specific uh, things, but knowing that you should not focus on certain things that we do not want to uh, focus on. So I think just standardizing the way that we do reviews, having accountability, responsibility by editors and the community is really important. So just peer review is very strange to me. I have to say, it's one of the things that really disappoints me about the uh, scientific uh, process. There's so many ways to improve this. Peer community gets a little bit closer uh, to that, but we do need, uh, I can tell you, first three years, I was very hesitant to push back on a reviewer. I really thought that I should appease them all the time. I now not only push back on reviewers, I push back on editors uh, as well. Um, I really think it's important that if you really see that somebody said something that does not make sense, that you make it clear to them that you think that this doesn't make sense and give them the opportunity to reconsider. So many times editors give us comments about replications that I know for a fact are false, right? And then they reject the paper. And then I, 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 I used to never do this because, you know, I'm scared of senior editors. Uh, I don't want to disappoint them, uh, upset them because I worry about my future papers. Or I worry about my collaborators' future. But I no longer think like this because I already saw that this is an investment in the future. If an editor makes a mistake, they need to know about this, right? I'll, I'll tell you another thing that we're doing, which is really important. If we're getting, um, so we got a rejection, a rejection that makes no sense and has a mistake. We request a reconsideration where we write why this is a mistake and doesn't make any sense. And they say, thank you, still reject. And then I say, uh, great. Can we please uh, forward this decision letter to a different journal? What does that mean? Collabora Psychology, JDM Journal, I don't know if you're familiar with this, are willing to do streamlined reviews with no additional peer review, only the editor, if you forward a decision letter from the other journal. So the only thing that you need to do to ask them, can you please grant me to forward this decision letter to somebody else? So you can first push back on something that is a mistake. When there's a mistake, you say, okay, you think that way, but please allow me to forward these great reviews. Let's say both of them are positive, supportive, but you decided to reject to another journal and then we'll publish this with them, no problem. In addition, one of the biggest problems is that this really seems like a trust system and a waste of resources. Because if we, like you said, and I also did this, Reject from this journal, try this journal. Reject from this journal, try this. It's just a waste of resources. So if everything was open, or if we can forward our decision letters from one journal to the other, we're just saving community resources that are already very scarce. 
So everybody is really overloaded and all of that. So especially if there is an issue where, okay, so your prestigious uh, high impact factor journal doesn't want this. That's fine. Let me use this decision because maybe somebody else can, can accept based on that. So for example, as, as a reviewer, I used to think that I have no power whatsoever. But when I started refusing doing reviews, if they don't share their data and their, and their code, so suddenly you understand, you actually, you have a lot of power. So being part of the community means that you can also change the community, even if you're only a student or an early career researcher. If you don't review, and I don't review, if we don't see the, then nobody will review, then journals will change to, okay, now we understand. In order to get reviewers, we need to change uh, the way things are. So it is a community effort. Uh, and I think the only way to hold journals accountable is to try and uh, aggressively change their practices like that. So I really think it's important that if we see something that is not reasonable, that we say something about this in order to open this as a discussion for the community. And I do this increasingly more and more. So maybe, maybe what I should do, aside from peer community, like I have a lot of things to talk about, but I feel like I should just show you stuff. Uh, instead of talking about it, we can talk about it later or you can catch up with some other talks. So maybe it's more important to show you some of the ways that we accomplish what we accomplish. Uh, but I should uh, very briefly say, just so you understand, uh, all of my courses, uh, Judgment, Decision-Making, Advanced Social Psychology, undergraduate students do real science projects. Um, so at the beginning, I mean, I'll just uh, show you. Uh, yeah, so we have... Uh, two. So this is what we did in the first two or three years with data collection. Within one semester, they do an entire replication project. Uh, we moved in the last two years to them writing a stage one registered uh, report. Uh, so I'll show you what that looks like, but the whole process is outlined over here. Uh, you can see how it's done. They do the qualtrics, they do the analysis of the target article. We randomly generate the data set, then they write the draft. And then I get people from Twitter and my teaching assistants and me, we all give feedback and we have two teams of two students and then they review each other. So we have a lot of checks and balances. Uh, but the important thing I want to tell you, and we can talk about this later or follow up on email, is that at the end over here, we have an APA style submission ready manuscript that is a stage one registered report. And we invite early career researchers as early as uh, masters to come in and take the lead. So you come in, you verify what the students have done. If you want, you can add your own stuff, your own extensions or whatever. Uh, make sure that everything is comprehensive and then we submit this together to peer community or whatever it is that you want to submit to. Uh, and then I have funding to cover the data collection for that. Uh, so we have by now, around 50 early career researchers from around the world. So I think when we talked about this, this mm -hmm. is the kind of model that we had. Always do it here. So in my classes, this is what happened. Uh, so all these are masters, these are master students, these are undergraduate students. So I, I don't know, a bunch of them, uh, about 40 early career researchers from various yeah. countries in the world. And then students in my courses, I think right now is 400, something like that okay. altogether. Um, so uh, this is like what we finished all together. So I'm going to show you these uh, resources, and then I'm going to show you what I'm doing with my thesis students, which comes at the end. So I just want to show you that at the end, uh, all of these result in publications. So this is, for example, from 2021. This is 2022. And this is so far May 2023. And I just want to show you what that looks like. The early career researcher is you. Uh, you're first followed by the students who are underlined over here, followed by the teaching assistants, and then me training at the back. And you and the students, if it's with data collection already completed, you and the students are shared the first co-author. If you are the lead on a stage one register report, then you're the first and they are shared the second. Uh, but this is how the model is. So by now, when I came into Padova last time, we didn't have many publications, but now we have. So this model really works. So we've shown the successful proof of concept with early career researchers and students in Hong Kong uh, working very well in order to get this to publications in some very good uh, journals, well-known journals, or even in economics, journal of experimental social psychology, judgment decision-making, and so forth. Um, yeah.
Here community university report, which is what I'll show you, is what I've done uh, with all my thesis students. So everybody who does a thesis with me, uh, and the thesis is within one year, and actually it's less than that, six, six months. Every thesis done with me is submitted to peer community in registry report. How is this possible that we're able to do everything within one year? Peer community in registry report has something amazing, which is guaranteed to give peer review within two weeks. So no other journal has ever been able to promise this to us. And so far for all of these students, this is already published stage two, this is in principle acceptance. They have delivered two weeks guaranteed. How does this work? And this I'll end and then I'll start showing you stuff. There is something called scheduled review. In the first, uh, when you first have a plan, you prepare a snapshot. This is a one page snapshot that includes the research question, predictions, hypothesis, and plan data analysis only in one page. I'll show you that page very, very briefly. Once you submit a snapshot, six weeks start. You can work on your thesis, your report, or the replication, and they recruit reviewers. When they recruit the reviewers, they show them snapshot is here. This is what the, the manuscript is gonna be about this snapshot. Six weeks from now, make sure that you have one week to review. So the reviewers know everybody is aligned for this one uh, specific deadline. When you submit the manuscript, the reviewers are already waiting for you to give the review in one week, then an additional week for the editor. Two weeks, you get uh, a review, which is unbelievable. They also really try to only do one round because they get the reviews. The editors uh, tell you, do A, B, C, D. If you do A, B, C, D, we'll give you the in-principle acceptance. So many of these submissions only have one round. If we have two rounds, it's usually a very quick round and the editor does not require an additional. So this is how we're able to make this magic happen together with peer community. Okay, so after all this uh, said and done, Okay, so this is my, my website, it's mgt.org. Um, yeah, hope you can see that. Um, there's a bunch of things that you can look at. I'll start from resources and examples because this is where things, uh, another opportunity for you to, uh, to join us. We started a lot of collaborative resources, so we have a lot of templates and guides. You can actually participate in those, so you can, not only use them, but if you see a mistake or something missing and you add this, you put your detail, you tell us what you've contributed, and then you become a co-author on the preprint on the future version of this. So this is how it happen. This is how we do hackathons. So a community updates all of this together. So students update this, teaching assistants uh, update this, I update this, and community updates. So this is how uh, we make sure that these are really good. I'll show you the beginning, for example, uh, if you want to know how to uh, calculate the fake size and confidence intervals, you can just like open this. Uh, I'll open also power analysis. Um, so you'll see that it's a very detailed. So uh, at some point, we just make this into a manuscript. This continue, the same continue from the register report. This is another MPL student that worked with me. These are three that just from the community joined us. Uh, and then you'll see just very, very detailed. So for example, how to do uh, an effect size calculation of a t test, pair sample t test, one sample t test, count and proportion. And you'll see that we specify all of the effects, the possible effects, uh, quite a bit of those here. You can see the community is actually adding some stuff uh, and making this better all the time. And then we also have the R code. So it becomes a really good resource so that even students as early as second year undergraduate that know nothing about effect sizes or methodology can use these very detailed guides in order to accomplish what it is that they need. I'll give you another example, and this is perhaps the most uh, useful for you with the register report, is that we have a main manuscript template and a supplementary template. So I'll open both of these. So this is what our templates look like. Uh, they're meant to look like a comprehensive What a good pre-registration plan is basically a manuscript. 
I don't understand the templates on OSF or an as predicted because I don't think they're specified enough. I really think that in order for us to be able to know how to evaluate something, it needs to be as close as possible to a real manuscript. The only difference is that a register report manuscript would be built on simulated data, randomized data rather than real data. So in the templates, what you'll see is that it just looks like a manuscript. So students really know how to follow this very carefully. So we have everything in the title page. We have like a contributorship. So everything that we saw that might be helpful for others uh, is added here. Here, community and register report snapshot. So when I told you that there's a one page snapshot, this is how uh, we do it. We add the research question, the hypothesis, the study design, the key analyses, uh, conclusions and key references. Very, very simple. And we have instructions on how to, for you to do this. And we also have examples for you to look at. Here Community Register Report also asks for our study design table where you have all of your questions, hypothesis, something, analysis, rational interpretation in one table. That makes everybody aligned to know what is it that is being evaluated. I'll show you an example of that as well. And then it just looks like a, a regular manuscript. You have the abstract, you have the uh, background of if it's a replication, what is the phenomenon name and what does it mean? And in this register report, we ran this on Amazon Mechanical Turk with this uh, sample, so forth, so forth. This is an important line. The following findings are concluded from simulated random noise and will be updated after data collection. So you leave this blank. And then at the top, you have something called important abstract method and result for written using randomized data set produced by Qualtrics to simulate what those sections would look like after data collection. They will be updated following data collection. So in each section, we actually have these warnings method. Methods and results were written using randomized. So that even though it looks like a manuscript, people are very clear that this is a plan. This is not a real manuscript. And also, of course, of the results section. We have the same warning here again. Uh, and then basically for each section, they know exactly what to put in. What is the background? What is the phenomenon? What is the study for replication? So we're very focused on replications, but then the students just know how to follow, how to specify everything. They already know hypothesis, the extensions. So we have the text that they need to update and we have some notes to help them do this a little bit better. Uh, we put some template of how they should structure their arguments more or less, and then we have all kinds of disclosures about pre-registration in open science. And in the method, we really try to make this as clear as possible about how to do a how to describe a power analysis. What did you do with the power analysis? Who the participants are? What is the design and the procedure? So, for example, we uh, now describe all of our designs using this kind of table to really show the experimental. So we want a reviewer to be able to go to one table, one figure, and completely within a few seconds understand what the experiment is about without having to read the text or find where in the text does it say what the manipulation is. So basically I wanted to specify for each IV, all the conditions, IV, IV1, IV2, and then all the dependent variables. So I'll show you an example of how we do this. So over time, I pre-tested this again and again with students. This seems to be the best way for us to communicate with reviewers. Every time we get a review and we see that they misunderstood, we improve the tables. So I suggest that you follow what it is that we uh, do here in order to communicate things better. We also always include a Qualtrics file. So we have the link to the preview because we see that reviewers, if you want really good feedback from them, you really want them to be on your side and catch your errors, you should provide them with uh, as much information as possible, uh, as easily accessible as possible. So we really try to make it one click for them. Click and then they see their survey. One click and they links to, to the OSF. So we specify exactly what links to uh, put in each uh, place. Predictors, manipulations, all the measures, um, extensions that we added, the deviations. So how did you uh, deviate? How do you evaluate the replication findings? Uh, is it a close replication or far replication? So we have, uh, of course, templates for that as well based on some criteria that we found. Um, and then the results. So we try to simulate what the results uh, would look like. Um, 
So replication, some plots, and then finally in the discussion, even though the discussion should only be updated after you have the results, you can already plan to discuss certain things. And the same things keep coming up with the reviewer saying, yeah, but it's not generalizable. You need to discuss theory. So we added just like the template of implications, limitations, constraints, um, theory, generalizability, and population. So this should make it very easy for you as a student, as an early career researcher, as a scholar, to just go step by step and replace uh, certain sections. If you see something missing, of course, you can come to it to help make that better. We also have a template for a very extensive uh, supplementary. So actually, most times our supplementary materials are longer than a manuscript because we add a lot of things that we think are not core for the main manuscript, but is really important for the transparency and comprehensiveness. So you'll see also the things like, for example, when we analyze the original article, uh, everything about that, from the type of study, experimental design, attention checks, manipulation checks, dependent variables, the results, we try to be as comprehensive as possible, uh, all the materials and the scales used in our experiment, comparisons and deviations, so for example, uh, original versus replication or the pre, um, uh, before exclusion and after exclusion. So we just have uh, templates for each one of those. And then finally at the end, we compare the pre-registration uh, versus the final um, and the final data analysis. So how did you de deviate in what way did you deviate and so forth? Yeah, all right. So these are the templates here. Um, I'll show you uh, an example. Uh, I'll show you this from the peer community in register report website. So all the uh, persons working with me, undergraduates and early career researchers follow this template and what is required by the peer community. So I'll go to the peer community register report. So actually you can see from this morning, uh, this is ours. So this is one of my thesis students uh, revisiting the belief in the law of small numbers, which is Tversky and Kahneman, the first thing that they ever published. So this doesn't get more JDM than this. Yeah. That people believe, um, people ignore sample size. And actually Kahneman kind of reflected on himself that in thinking fast and slow, he included a whole chapter about social priming. And he fell into the trap that he told everybody about in 1971. So this is really the first thing that they ever published and we thought is really important here, especially because we really believe in the register report. But this just goes to show you that we're very, very active on this. So actually this is ours, this is ours. Uh, Chin Yu uh, did another one with us. Uh, this is ours. So the last three <laughs> from Peer Community is ours. And then uh, we just have like a bunch of those. This is ours. So. This is a lot of activity. So out of, I think, uh, 400 submissions in peer community, about 25 are from our team. So we really believe in this. We're very invested in this. And you can see that for almost all of those is Chris Chambers is actually our editor. So you can see even here, he keeps doing this with us. Uh, this is another one that he did with us. So really it's, it's amazing to see Chris Chambers work with us uh, on, this, on this stuff. Um, which one should I show you? I can just show you this one. So what does it look like? So first of all, you can see this is public. So the stage one endorsement is public. Everybody can access this. It's actually citable. So if you open this, uh, I'll just open two. I'll open, this is a stage one, stage one. And I'll show you one of our projects, which is, this is stage two, also one of our projects. So I'll show you stage one and stage two. In the stage one, what you can see here, is that uh, it has um, his recommendations. So actually, uh, so he explained why this was accepted, how many reviews it went through, which is really, really nice. And then they created an automatic registration for us. So once they accepted this, they went into the OSF and because we already gave them approval, they uh, created uh, this, I think it's still pending. I think it takes like 70 because it's from this morning. It takes some time, but I'll just show you here. Um, yeah, this is the stage one. Yeah, so in the stage one, you can see that they created an automatic. Yeah. 
So yeah, they created this. I did not create this. This is an automatic uh, uh, in principle acceptance where they used our uh, in order to give us stage one IPA. So everything is is public and automatically generated by their platform once it's accepted uh, in, in principle acceptance. So what you can see here is they have their summary. They have the pre-registered protocol automatically created on the OSF. You have the list of eligible PCI RR friendly journals. This is an amazing revolution in science in that the community handles everything. It's by the community, for the community. Once the community endorses this, you have a list of journals that would automatically publish this for you. You don't need to go through additional peer review. So if I want to publish this with uh, RSOS, I can just go ahead and publish this with them, or Peer Community Journal, or Metapsychology. I don't need additional peer review. What happened with uh, this specific one, where we got stage two, is already amazing because um, you have two types of journals. Journals that are friendly, and they will publish this regardless of anything. So if you get an endorsement from the community, they will guarantee publish this with no additional peer review. But there are some ones that are interested. The interested ones just get signals from the community. And if they see something that's interesting for them, they reach out to you. How to know which journals? You have the list over here, friendly and interested. So I'll just open these two. So the friendly ones that will automatically publish this for you are all of these. Uh, they're relatively open science friendly, but also relatively lower on impact factor. To some of my students and collaborators, the impact factor is very important. So they are a little bit hesitant to go here, which is why they also have this category, friendly journal. And here you have all kinds of other journals, for example, collaborative psychology, Simin Hazir, Journal of Experimental Psychology, General Nature, Human Behavior. So if you have a good register report, and they're interested in this, they will contact you. You can also try and contact them. So I can tell you that for each and every um, student, uh, PCIRR, student project that I had, Semin Vazir contacted me and said, this is great. Would you consider publishing this with Collabra? So actually the first two PCIRR were publishing this with Collabra. For this specific project, Something remarkable happened that I never thought will happen is Journal of Experimental Psychology General, which is considered to be a very high impact factor, reached out and the editor said, would you consider publishing with us? I guess, of course, I would consider publishing with you because for the early career researcher, this could be like a, a way forward with the job market. He's only a first year PhD student, but you know, this will really help him. So we submitted this and hopefully um, it needs just to go through. Uh, so an editor needs to make an editorial decision. So that's the only thing that happens. So they reached out to us, which has never happened to me before. So here with this one, you'll see there's the recommendation. And then, and this is remarkable, you have an open peer review. So this is the valuation too. You can see what Chris Chambers wrote, Dirich Soman. So this is a replication of Soman comparing time, replication of someone. So someone was one of the reviewers. So you can actually see what someone wrote, um, what it is that they've done. You can read their review. You can read each one of them. It's identified and open. So everybody knows exactly who was, uh, and here you can see how many rounds they are, both for stage one and for stage two. And in stage two, you can see this is mixed evidence. So we had three studies, one worked, the other didn't work in that there was no difference between time sunk costs and money sunk costs. So it worked, but not in the way that the original uh, expected. Uh, but then the nice thing is that you can actually see someone giving his, so first of all, Chris Chambers giving their reviews, but also someone saying this stage two is ready for prime time. So it's really nice that everybody can see that the original author publicly wrote this uh, sort of thing and they can see all the reviews. Not only can they see the reviews, but they can see how we replied to these reviews. So I'll show you an example for the reply. And of course, track changes files. So if you look at our reply, this is also one of the templates. Actually, if you go, uh, where was this? Don't worry, got lost with this. Uh, I'll open another one. Uh, 
Um, resources and examples, you know, we have here. Yeah, how to write a reply. I know this might seem very basic, but many early career researchers and undergraduates don't know how to write a reply letter. So actually we have a template for you. So how to reply, a table that makes everything clear, uh, all kinds of tips on how to do this better and a template for how to reply to the editor. And it just makes everything a lot easier. So you can see that they follow this very, very well. And one of the important things that I really, now I know is very important is to allow the reviewers to very easily see the change between one version to another version. Because it can't be more frustrating as a reviewer when somebody said, you, you gave, I don't know, uh, two paragraphs, say, yeah, I think you should do this, you should do that. And then it says, done. How was it done? Where was it done? Can I see the differences? Do you want me to start looking at all the differences? So here we have just like the comparison of the two manuscripts, the uh, new version here, the old version here, and you can just very easily uh, browse through these in order to see what the differences were and how this was addressed. And then you can compare this to what is happening in the actual manuscript. So everything just becomes very, very clear and everything that we have just links back into that. So we have a very structured kind of template. We have a structured way of presenting to the reviewers what it is that we want them uh, to, to do. Yeah, and in addition, uh, a link to the revised manuscript, I'll just show you uh, what that looks like. Okay, so this is, so peer community in registry reports, but everything in peer community actually works on publicly posted preprints. So it's not like something is uh, hidden somewhere. It's uh, everything is published uh, publicly. So I really like this. I like transparency. I like sharing as much as possible. So first you post a preprint on open science framework or wherever you want. And then you ask the community to review that for you. This is what our open science framework uh, project looks like. So you can see over here, we have stage one, we have stage two. For each one of those, you can actually see each and every step of the way. So it's not like they only see the finalized version. We want people to be able to see what happened in each and every step of the way. So this is our first submission. This is our second submission. And for every one, we have a comparison. We have track changes, we have the response to the reviewers, and then we have uh, the ability for them to uh, see this side by side. So anybody from outside can see the evolution of this manuscript and what happened in every stage of the way. I feel it's really important to see the contributions of everybody and what happened from the submission to the final uh, result. So you have the power analysis. We share, of course, all the Qualtrics survey. We have all the simulated data set and the planned data analysis with the R markdown and uh, uh, the output. So just make it very easy for everybody to follow everything that we've, uh, that we've done. So I'll just give you an example from what um, uh, the output looks like. It opens. Yeah, so this is what it looks like. So R markdown, I don't know if you're familiar, you can even write manuscripts with this, but generally it just, it makes it very easy because you have all the analysis. It makes it very uh, clear which hypothesis tested which study, what analyses, um, and then everybody can of course open the code in order to see what exactly created this, how were the variables created. So actually this is exactly the same R markdown that we had in stage one run on the simulated data sets. So they can see in the stage one based on our simulated data set exactly what is going to happen. The only thing that we needed to do for the stage two is take the new data set, plug it in, knit this again, and then we have the output together. And then you can compare the first version to the second version and see exactly what happened in between those side by side. Um, yeah, so you can see that, you can see the Qualtrics, and yeah, if you want to see what a snapshot looks like, this is what the snapshot look like. You can even see our cover letters. I think it's really a good way to learn because we usually don't see each other's cover letters. So you can see all of our cover letters, everything that we've done. This is how simple a snapshot is. Uh, title, authors, 
keywords, research question, hypothesis, study design methods, key analysis. This is what makes it happen to have your review within uh, two weeks. Mm -hmm. So anything that you want to see about our process, you can just go on uh, this web page. If you don't want to go from the peer community, you want to see all of our projects, you can actually go to the uh, core team. Core team is about all our team, everything that we do, our Google Scholar page and, and all of that. You can also see some presentations about what is our team, who is on the team, some summary, all of the uh, publications that we have and the preprints and what state there are and you know which one's got IPA, uh, who is on the team, could be you at some point. Completed replications, if you want to, um, yeah. If you want to join us, you can uh, look at which ones are open. So these are with data collection. So everything that has open, open, open is available for you to take the lead on. I don't know if you want something on an escalation of commitment, you can just come here and have a look. Uh, if you want to see what those look like, to see just how good they are, um, you can go back to the resources and examples. And actually all of the students' reports, everything that they've done, is actually shared over here. So if you want to see the ones with the replications and extensions and the data collection, it's available for you for each year. You have a different link and everything is summarized here on the Airtable. So for example, here in 2019, you can see that we had two teams of two students working independently uh, and then they peer reviewed each other. One team we ran with a data collection of Amazon Mechanical Turk Americans. And then we had a second team. So these are Americans on MTurk. And the second team is uh, British people on Prolific Academic. You can see the sample sizes. And then you can actually have access, complete access to everything that the students did in order to evaluate if you want to lead this project. So you can go on any one of those just to give an example. I don't know. Um, of what that looks like. The manuscript, you can see that they just followed everything on the template. So it really looks like a manuscript. It's ready for you to take in, verify. It's very comprehensive. It really looks like a manuscript. It just awaits an early career researcher to take it to publication. So it just uh, follows, follows everything. And then you can decide if you want to take this or not. Yeah, so we have the core team. And then finally, these are the planned replications. If you prefer to do a registered report with us, you can look at which one need lead. Right now we have nine that need uh, need lead. Uh, they're also available for you to, so from 2020 to 2021. If there's one topic here that you feel like you want to uh, look into uh, according to, I don't know, helping happiness, you can go have a look at the results, uh, the, the manuscript, the outputs, and then see if you want to take it together with us. So actually, if you're scared of register reports, you don't know if you want to invest the time, this really helps reduce the risk. You can just get your hands dirty into trying to understand what the process is. And then later, after you finish one with us, uh, you can uh, proceed, proceed with your own uh, learning about the process, looking at our templates, working with other early career researchers in our team, and just getting a better perspective of what the, the stage uh, stage one and stage two peer community look like. So I know that was super fast and very, very brief. And I went through this very, uh, very fast, but there are other YouTube uh, videos that take you step-by-step step through each one of those. I'm always available for you if you want to contact me by email, if you want to discuss something. Even if I'm very, very busy, I can connect you to the other 40 uh, early career researchers in the team to provide you with additional information. So don't hesitate. I know a lot of undergraduates, uh, students, uh, early career researchers are scared of contacting professors. Don't, don't be. So we're very eager to work with you. Uh, either if you want to join us or if you have a question about registered reports, uh, this is what we're doing this team for. This is what it's about. So we want you to reach out and, and ask us. We'd love to help. Yeah? yeah. Okay, good. All right, do you have any questions? Any questions? I have one. Please, yes. I just I, I want to make sure I understood yeah. how the peer right. community works. So yes. effectively, 
you're doing a register method, just you don't know to which journal you're going to apply to, is it? You're doing that, it with the community. Right. Okay. You don't care about what journal. Yeah, yeah. so that's the a second step, but you're probably doing like register method, and then once it's, it's accepted, you're just going to choose the journal, basically. That's, that's it. Yes. So if it's endorsed by the community, yeah, it's automatically yeah. can be published with any of the friendly journals. And the, in, the interested journals will get uh, a notification and they can contact you. Yeah. Actually, you can also contact a journal that it's not on this list and say, we have endorsement from the mm -hmm. community. Would you uh, allow us a publication? So it really shifts the power from the for-profit publishers to you. Actually, it happened even with Collabra um, uh, that some of them have APCs, they have fees. You say, if you want to publish with us, open access, $1,000, right? They say, you, you contacted us. We can go to any other journal. So do you want us to go to a different journal? Say, okay, so we waive the fees. You know? So you have a lot of power. You can choose. Uh, I really hope that this is going to change the academic publishing system. This, this is how it should be. Yes. Yeah, huh? You don't take time, yeah. Yeah, it's happening. I think uh, peer community in register report is one of many peer community in. In peer community in, they're not doing register report. They're doing this with the data. But actually, it's the community reviewing by the community for the community. And then what journal it gets published in, it really it doesn't really matter that much. It's already a preprint. It's out there. It's endorsed by the community. Everything else is semantics. And I really think in like five years, it's already happening with the other peer community in, but in five years, this is going to be, in my view, uh, the number one way to evaluate uh, somebody's it's quality. A good way to evaluate their prints. Yeah. But with COVID, we saw so many peer prints come out, we cited thousands of times, and yeah. nobody really evaluated them. So yeah. peer prints are great, but uh, must have some kind of yeah. Um, we have an online question. Yeah. So, what was it? Yeah, the mic is not working well, so we are using this. So, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for this workshop. I'm pretty excited about this topic, actually. And I have a couple of questions or things that I fear that I've just missed during the workshop. So I hope it will not be a problem to repeat it. Uh, so the first one is um, uh, like uh, what what if you have like a paper, if you're thinking like about a research question and you know that you will run like multiple studies to have kind of a multiple study paper, like how does it work? Like, do you have to do it like for each study a different thing or do you, in the beginning you expect some results so you can have it like all the studies together or how does it work or maybe it's just like for single studies i don't know like yeah uh, i think up until peer community and register report we had one option which is a single shot study mm -hmm. uh, could be multiple samples, but it's basically around a single quantifiable research question so you finish that project and then you go to another project I'll show you one thing. Mm -hmm. Your community, you have something called Yeah. So if you go here and you go to their policies, yeah. Something called programmatic RRs for large or long-term research programs. So actually they have uh, uh, an option for you to have mm -hmm. multiple stages, which is especially good for a thesis where you want to say, first, I will have this project. Then based on that, I will follow up with that project. Each one is evaluated independently. However, they're updated under the same umbrella. So mm -hmm. you have continuity with the same editor and the same reviewers that will see each and every step and support you uh, with that. Uh, it's different publications, so you can have three different publications from the same program, but it does allow you to do more than just a single study if you want to have uh, multiple multiple stages. But each one of the steps will probably be a single one. You can plan in advance to have more than one study, 
But mm-hmm. honestly, my personal feeling is that it's a little bit too much for the reviewers. It's just, I think, my personal view. A single study per publication is the right amount for you to really get good constructive feedback from reviewers. If it gets more than that, then reviewers just get lost between them. There's just too much going on. I run the simplest studies. I run vignette studies in judgment decision making. And you can go and see the level of detail that we need to go into. To have two studies like that seems very complicated to me. People who do two studies like that, not in JDM, but with something else, just seems impossible to me. So I actually don't know how peer review, real peer review, constructive, detailed peer review happens on other manuscripts. I think this is closer to what I perceive to be the ideal. So just do these as part of a programmatic register report uh, option in peer community. Okay, okay. Yeah, I know, because like my question was, because I don't know, maybe you can think about an experiment. And the thing is that it can seem like not enough for a publication. So that was more like maybe for that reason, then you should think about more experiments. But it makes sense that it's actually like very complicated to have the review of like a project that has no data collected and you just try to have feedback for all the studies and this kind of thing. Um, Yeah. I think it's, it's very difficult to envision several studies. Most of the times you can study and then right. the next one is not going to be as good the way you thought right. about. You know, you have new insights from your data. Exactly. So from that point of view, I think it's uh, uh, it's very difficult on both sides. Yeah. To yeah. Uh, yeah. Whenever I think... Whenever I see, let's say, a JPSP, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, 10 studies, 8 studies, I can't help but wonder how many file drawers are there in there? How many pretests are there that we didn't even, that we don't see? Uh, everything just seems too perfect. You know, 6 out of the 6, 8 out of the 8, 10 out of the 10 worked. Really? Everything worked? That seems very suspicious to me. So just generally, I really like the programmatic way of you ex- execute something, you learn something, you build for the next stage, and you involve the reviewers in the community in each step of that. Then mm-hmm. you can write a new research report that leads to something that is already out. Okay. Yeah. Based on these, we um, these new questions yes. that we would like to answer and, and change the other so yes. yes. It's still together. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And I have also another question, if I can um that uh, i kind of miss so because i remember that you said that uh once you have like the um, the register wrapper you have like the reviews and everything then it's also easier to like um it can be easier to 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 get some grants or funding to to collect data right and so my question is like how much time do you have though like is it something that you receive like the review like uh, answers and you can just do collect the data but then do you have a kind of a deadline or how does it work? Because sometimes you don't have like specific grants that you can apply to in that specific moment. So I don't know, like, is there can, any kind of rule on that? In peer community, there's no rule about a deadline for a revision or when you need, even, even in stage one, even before stage two, even before in principle acceptance, there's no deadline for how long a revision should take. Actually, with one of the projects, we are a year and a half late. Uh, and they asked us, do you want to keep this in the system or should we close this? And actually, there's a good reason why the person could not do this. Plus, it's been difficult two, three years for everybody, I think. So it makes it makes sense. It just means they're not uh, highly pressured in terms of time. But I think they do ask, you to keep them updated uh in terms of the funding i -hmm. think you can go uh you can you can try and find different i don't know how the funding works wherever you are uh, but there are some uh, ways of doing the two together Um, Mm -hmm. i would actually yeah there is a way with scheduled reports to arrive at a point where you know, let's say the grant submission deadline for us, it's uh, middle of October. So you can start a certain time where you know that you're very likely to get everything done 
which is the way that I do things with my thesis students, by the uh, beginning of October. Two weeks later, you submit that as, as a grant proposal, and then you hear back in, I don't know how long it takes here, but like three months, you already know if you have support for this or not. So because of scheduled reviews, and because you know what the deadlines are for your grants and how long it takes them, you can really streamline the whole uh, the whole situation in order to make that happen. Uh, but sometimes you would want to check in advance with the grant authority that they really care about registered reports. Uh, right. So you can approach them and say, if I get you a guaranteed publication in, let's say, Nature Human Behavior, <laughs> would you be willing to fund this? And I don't know any funder that would say no to this kind of uh, <laughs> offer because it really, for them, it's a lot of risk. And they're also always a little bit skeptical of how to distribute the money. If you have two candidates, one gives you a guaranteed publication and the other one is like, maybe I, as a funder, uh, I know this doesn't work on a government level, but let's say John Templeton or some of the other more private funders, the effective altruism movement, if you have something guaranteed, of course, this is, this is much better for them. So you need to check which grants uh, would go for this and you can talk to them in advance to see if this would if this will work. It doesn't mean that you don't have to go through a review. It just means that going through the review increases your chances if it's a registry board. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right. That's my Thank recommendation. You. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, what I did, by the way, uh, maybe with this we can finish. Uh, I just wanted to show you. Yeah. So this is the slide I didn't uh, put in. I So actually, this is not by the research uh, folks, this is by the teaching folks. And actually, I suggest this to offer this at the university as well, because universities dream, fantasize about students publishing their thesis, because you have so many theses at the university. Uh, if you can uh, somehow capitalize on that in order to reach all of those with a publication, this is the wet dream of every university, right? So I suggested something called a registered report challenge where I said to the university, would you be willing to fund, if I give you in principle acceptance by a student thesis, would you be able to fund the, uh, the thesis? So they said as a proof of concept, which we definitely showed is successful, 30 students will give a thousand dollars, which is, if you think about it, it's ridiculous. $30,000 is so much less than each of the uh, grants that they give. So this is like a, a very small proportion. So from $30,000 that usually would give you maybe a third of a chance to get a publication, they get 30 publications. What university wouldn't go for these odds? So you can approach the university and say, we want a Padova University Register Report Challenge. If a student shows is a, a thesis in principle acceptance from the community, would you be willing to, to fund this? I think as a university, it would be insane not to capitalize on, on something like that because there's absolutely zero risk. So it doesn't even have to be the research authorities. Uh, you can even go for the teaching authorities uh, because you're all students, early career researchers. Um, you, can, you can just uh, play with uh, uh, the university's incentives and the, the need to reduce risk for them as much as possible when they invest money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really like great. Thank you so much for the workshop in general and also for answering the questions.